Well, good, good morning, everybody, um, and thank you for joining us today for this discussion on Afghanistan. We'll be looking at the political, security, and human rights situation and dynamics, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers, so I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Uh, my name is Noreen Chowdhury Fink. I'm the executive director of the Sufan Center. And for those of you who don't know us, we're an independent nonprofit organization focused on research, strategic anal analysis, and dialogue. And one of the things that we take great pride in is the privilege to bring together a team like this for um, important policy discussions, you know, on, on some of the pressing, most pressing security issues that confront us today. And we know that landscape is constantly changing. Um, you know, today we'll be talking about Afghanistan. This is not our first conversation on it. Um, some of you may have seen we recently held our global security forum in March, and we had a very important discussion on the situation in Afghanistan there. Um, and we have been on the screen before also talking about um, Afghanistan and the immediate aftermath of the Taliban takeover. Um, and so I think it's important to see, um, for us to be able to come together today and see where things are, what the trajectory has been and where things are going. And to shepherd us through that discussion, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Colin Clark, who is a senior research fellow here at the Sufan Center. And Colin will be moderating today's discussion. So on behalf of TSC, welcome. I hope you'll explore our work. You you know, we'll, we'll put some of the relevant things into the chat. So please feel free to click on those links, check out the conference, and thanks for joining us today. Colin, the screen is yours. Thanks, Doreen. Uh, and thanks to everybody joining us uh, from wherever you are in the world. We've got a, a very fascinating discussion today with some of the top minds on Afghanistan. Um, it's, it's amazing to me that despite everything that's going on in Afghanistan, and, and for those that watch the country closely, there is uh, quite a lot happening, it still manages to kind of stay on the margins of the, the mainstream media. Um, Ukraine obviously dominates, and there's a lot of domestic political discussion in the United States. But I think for those that are interested in what's happening, the latest trends, developments, and projections going forward, you couldn't have a better group uh, than we have assembled here today. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce uh, each of our speakers. Uh, they will provide opening remarks, and then we'll get into a moderated discussion. Um, we've got joining us today, Aryan Sharifi, lecturer and associate research scholar at Princeton University, uh, Amira Jadun, assistant professor at Clemson University, and Yanni Koskinas, chief executive officer at the Hoplite Group. And we're going to start with Aryan. So um, I'll pass it over to you. Um, and, and please. Uh, thank you, Colin. Thank you, Noreen. And uh, good morning to uh, to everyone. It's certainly great to be here um, uh, on the panel today and share a few thoughts uh, with you all on the current status of things in Afghanistan. Um, one of the major themes, one of the major debates, in fact, that I see unfolding right now is this issue of the presence of foreign terrorist groups, particularly uh, uh, the Islamic State of uh, uh, Khorasan province uh, and the threat it poses beyond the Afghan border. So the debate, it seems that uh, in the region, and I also hear some voices in the United States, is on, uh, on the Taliban potentially being a good option, a viable counterforce uh, to this threat. Uh, many voices in the region and some in the West now call that the Taliban might be the only uh, viable, the only effective option to engage with uh, and to enable with uh, enable against uh, the threat of uh, these foreign terrorist uh, groups. Um, and I'm here today to very briefly say state my personal opinion based on the research that I conduct currently and based on the background that I have in the past, uh, that that is actually not a good course of option. The Taliban is not a reliable partner. Uh, the Taliban don't have either the willingness or the capabilities to effectively counter these terrorist uh, groups, foreign terrorist groups. And I'm going to point out to three main reasons for why I am making this argument. Now, reason number one is that the Taliban are actually no longer a unitary actor. Uh, for years, of course, under pressure, under military pressure by the former Afghan government and the uh, international forces, 
the movement stuck together. And even though there were some internal problems in there, but the movement as a whole stuck together and acted as a uni unified force. But since they returned to power and since that military pressure is no longer felt over the movement, at least four types of fragmentations have emerged and they are widening within the Taliban movement. Now, number one is a, a tribal fragmentation, really. Well, first of all, there is an issue between the Pashtun Taliban and the minority non-Pashtun Taliban. But even within the majority Pashtun Taliban, you've got this major rift. There is kind of a historical issue in Afghanistan. You've got, on the one hand, uh, the Durrani Pashtuns that is mainly from the south, and then you've got the Ghiljai Pashtuns that are mainly from the east. So this issue of Durrani Ghiljai rift has always been an issue within the Afghan politics, not among the people, among the top political figures. And that is also emerging within the Taliban and it's creating problems. Number two, there is a factional issue. And that factional fragmentation has always been there, but then since the past year or so, it's been widening even more. And that is mainly between, on the one hand, what is called the Quetta Shura, and on the other hand, you've got the Haqqani Network, which were two different organizations under the overall umbrella of the Taliban, but now they're kind of separating. Number three, there is an ideological fragmentation. As you know, there is the what, the, what is called the Kandahar Center that is actually led and headed by the Taliban Supreme Leader, Mullah Hebatullah, very hardliner, very hardcore. They do not want to swerve. They do not want to compromise on their ideological background. But then on the other hand, you've got what is called now the Kabul Circle, individuals like uh, like uh, acting uh, defense minister Mullah Yaqub, acting uh, interior minister uh, 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 Sarajuddin Haqqani. You've got Abbas Tonegzai. You have Mullah Baradar and quite a few other top leaders that are more on the moderate side. So there's this ideological rift between the Taliban movement as well. And then finally, you have the structural fragmentation, really. Uh, for years, uh, as we observed in the former Afghan government, the, the fighting machine of the Taliban was really based on this issue, on these units called the Delgai. Now, each Delgai consists of 70 to 90 individuals. Some go to 110, but these are basically squadrons. These are groups of 70 to 90 people that really form the fighting machine of the Taliban, the actual, the core uh, fighters that are that are within these Delgais. Now, the Delga, each Delgai is led, has been led by a, a, what they call the Delgai measure or a Delgai commander, or a unit commander. These unit commanders have been super powerful. Uh, for the past year, the top Taliban leadership have really tried to bring these del Delgais, the structure of the insurgent movement, and really bring it into the formal security forces of the government. But the Delgai commanders have refused to do so because they want to keep that structure. So there is the structural fragmentation, there's the ideological fragmentation, the factional fragmentation, and the tribal fragmentation, which makes the Taliban not a viable partner. You cannot really count anyone, keep anyone responsible for anything. That's number one. Number two is the presence of foreign terrorist groups and the symbiotic relationship between the Taliban and these 20 or so foreign terrorist groups that come really in three categories. You've got the Pakistani terrorist groups, every, everything from the Lashkar Tayyaba to Lashkar Jangvi to Jaish e Muhammad to Safai Saaba to TTP to there are in my research shows 12 to 14 Pakistani terrorist groups currently in Afghanistan. Then you've got the regional groups, at least three of them. You have the East Turkestan Islamist Movement, which is the Chinese Uyghurs or Uyghurs. You have the IMU or Islamic Movement of Uzbekistan. And you've got uh, Jamaat Ansarullah, or now what they call the Tajikistani Taliban. And then finally, you have the third category of foreign terrorist groups, really three groups. Uh, you have uh, Al-Qaeda, the core. You have Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. And then you have the ISKP or uh, Islamic State of Khorasan province. So the Taliban for years have had a symbiotic relationship with all of these. So with the exception of certain parts of ISK, the rest of them have had a very tight symbiotic relationship with the Taliban, at least in three ways. There's been the ideological ties, this issue of bai'a, meaning that the leadership of all of these terrorist groups, except ISK, have, have given bai'a to the Taliban supreme leader, or paid homage to the Taliban supreme leader. That's ideological. You have got the familial going really back to the 1980s with the entire, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
Arab Afghan movement. So for years, there have been a lot of intermarriages between Afghans and foreign uh, foreign fighters over there. So you've got a host of literally thousands of individuals that are hybrid Afghans and another. So familial ties are also there. And then finally, you've got the operational ties where for years, these groups have fought alongside with the Taliban against the former Afghan government and the coalition forces. So this makes the Taliban, in a way, inseparable from any of these terrorist groups, making it a very highly unreliable partner to counter any of them. And then finally, you've got the issue of, uh, uh, of uh, illicit economic activity, particularly the drug trade. Uh, you know, the Taliban are engaged in all sorts of uh, transnational illicit economic activities, but the drug trade is really the main thing. Uh, you know, for years, as is very clear, Afghanistan really supplied over 90% of the world opium and opium-related drugs. But uh, over the past several years, uh, this new synthetic drug, methamphetamine, has become really, really prevalent in Afghanistan. In fact, by some accounts, the total value of meth being produced and smuggled outside of Afghanistan really surpasses uh, the value of opium and opium-related drugs. And so, uh, Given these, at least these three issues, I'm arguing that the Taliban cannot be uh, a reliable partner to counter any of these terrorist groups for the international community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariane. I mean, really just a comprehensive overview of a lot of the challenges uh, that uh, countries face when thinking about Afghanistan. And you've given us a lot of food for thought for, for some follow-up. Um, I'll now turn it over to uh, Mira. Thank you, Colin. Uh, morning, everyone uh, who's tuned in. And thank you, Ariane, for your thoughts. I think they are really useful in setting the broader um, framework that we actually should be using to analyze some of the day-to-day -day developments. Um, so to just start off uh, and give everyone a clear idea of the kind of questions I ask and the kind of frameworks that I use to understand what is happening in Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, my research primarily focuses on understanding the effectiveness of international security and CT policies, but also the various causes and consequences of terrorism. And geographically, where I focus on Afghanistan and Pakistan, some of the key groups that I have been following are one is ISKP, obviously, on which I recently released a book, but also groups like TTP and Lashkar Jangvi, because as our previous panelist just said, all of these groups are really deeply intertwined. And this is why it's problematic to rely on the Taliban for various things, including their ability to conduct effective counterterrorism. So when we look at the South Asian context, right? So it's remarkable uh, that there are a large number of militant groups who have emerged there over several decades. Um, but what's also really remarkable and what we see for groups like ISKP and TTP is that they haven't just emerged there, they have managed to survive there uh, despite counterterrorism operations and 20 years of the war on terror. And then subsequently they have resurged um, and the reasons for um, their resurgence, such as TTP, ISKP, is because there are a lot of underlying um, sources that they rely upon in the domestic, in, in the region, um, such as access to illicit economies, um, the ability to engage in smuggling, uh, the ability to cooperate with each other, which allows them to continue to survive. Um, so in my own work, when I've looked at ISK or TTP um, or even uh, groups like Lashkar Jangvi, the two components that I really try and focus in on um, are intergroup relationships. So in the case of Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, I think it's important to keep an eye on how these alliances and rivalries shift because they shape militancy trends overall, but also specifically the behavior of some of these um, groups. And then also, what do deeper linkages between groups like Islamic State and domestic groups mean for terrorism in the region overall, um, and also their incentives to conduct external operations. So I'll briefly um, talk about ISKP, um, because I know there have been a lot of changes uh, from day to day. So we know there's been assassination campaigns by both ISKP and also um, the Taliban. Um, and whenever there's a drop in attacks, we immediately jump to the conclusion, because that's a conclusion we want to arrive at, is that ISK has been weakened and we do not need to worry about it any longer, right? Um, so I, I would encourage um, sort of everyone who's thinking about these day-to-day -day developments and trying to contextualize them is to think about 
the, the sort of the historical trends that we have been seeing with regards to ISKP. So ISK is now in its ninth year of existence. Um, and one thing that we can all, I think, agree upon is that the group is very tenacious. Um, and I think what's important to remember now in the context of recent assassinations of ISKP's top leaders um, is that ISK has survived intense CT operations in prior years, and it has demonstrated its ability to research, right, um, in environments which were much tougher than what we're seeing today. So whether ISK is now significantly degraded uh, to the extent that it cannot rebuild, you know, I, I think we should sort of pause there before we uh, jump to that conclusion. So I think it's important to briefly look at how ISK has adapted its strategy uh, over the past several years when it has faced pressure. So between 2015 and 2018, we know that ISK went all out. Uh, it had recruits from local militant groups. It had post members um, until it faced a significant decline in 2019, right? And it was declared defeated a couple of times by then. Um, but in 2020, as a weakened uh, organization, it wasn't completely eliminated. It switched its strategy. It adapted to... Um, the environment at that time, and it resorted to a strategy of provocation um, and outbidding um, and just sowing discord. So in the current environment, uh, since the Taliban have taken over, we have seen ISK switch its strategy again, right? We saw a targeted campaign um, against top leaders, ideologues, um, sort of an economic warfare, uh, lashing out against minorities, but then obviously also um, visibly showing its resolve to become a regional organization, right? So we have seen this reflected in its propaganda, but we have also seen it reflected in the series of attacks it has claimed externally um, in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Iran. Um, it's also attacked embassies. Um, so the willingness and the resolve is there, right? So um, I think before we jump to that conclusion that ISK has now been defeated and this decline currently is a signal of that, I think we need to remind ourselves that ISK uh, tends to adapt to its difficult circumstances um, and it has still access to those underlying resources which have provided it with the resiliency uh, that we have seen, right? It still has deep alliances with other groups. It is still able to engage in cross-border movements. It's engaged in smuggling, extortion, um, and it's still, its propaganda is uh, expanding, right? So the underlying sources of its strength are still there. Um, so we should be a little bit cautious when we, you know, start celebrating its defeat. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll stop there, but I can talk a little bit more um, about what we can expect to see um, if the Taliban continue to target ISK's top leaders based on what leadership decapitation against ISK has yielded in the past. Thank you so much. Uh, amazing to cover that much ground and be succinct at the same time. Um, I think my favorite part of that intervention was that uh, it confirms my own thinking of the group, which you know I, I'll defer to Amir as one of the top experts in the world on this, um, and and uh, I've been thinking a lot about it, especially as you mentioned with almost daily developments and uh, the assassination campaigns, and uh, I've been following uh, closely your Twitter feed and and Abdul Said and and those folks that you know look at this issue closely, um, and. Uh, I think there's still a lot to be said about what we're seeing right now. So uh, let me turn it over to, to Yanni. Um, take it from there. Thanks, Colin. And, and of course, being the third guy on deck, uh, you know, no doubt Aryan gets up there, just kills it. Amira just gets up there, just, just destroys it. And now my notes are completely gone. So I'll, I'll try to wing it a little bit. Um, look, I, um, I was going to talk a little bit um, about the Taliban and 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 their the nexus of you know terror groups there, but I think obviously the the my predecessors did an excellent job. So let me just take on a couple of the wave topics, if I may. Um, first of all, the Taliban control of of Afghanistan was just set that out there that it is completely against U.S. national interests. If, if we look at it purely from the prism of terrorism and counterterrorism, 
uh, I think that clearly the Doha agreement that you know was supposed to keep them or one of the preconditions was supposed to be to keep um, uh, some form of terrorist groups at bay um, clearly has you know failed exhibit a uh, I'm an al Zawahiri in you know July uh, in Kabul in Wazir Akbar Khan, you know, one of the, my, in the neighborhood I lived in, probably a few houses down from, from where I, did, I lived. Now, it, it's, if you think about it purely in the context of what's going on in 2022, I would say maybe you'd be surprised that he's there. Uh, but if you look at it from what the Taliban were doing when they were in control, Wazir Akbar Khan was actually a favorite spot for some of the Al Qaeda. Uh, members back in the day when when they were uh, living there in the 90s. So it's it's almost a back to the future uh, in the context of terrorist groups coming in there, particularly um, Al Qaeda. Uh, then you look at another one. You know, um, I saw uh, I'm sure everybody saw General Carrillo uh, give his talk about um, uh, Islamic State Horasan in uh, you know just a, a month and a half or so ago, and we're not talking about the big things, you know, uh, the Haqqani network is still in the director of national intelligence's uh, website, uh, uh, you know, as a, as a terrorist group, you know, and uh, if you look at their terrorist activities, I should say are highlighted on the DNI's website. If you go to the FBI, uh, they're still putting up a $10 million reward for Shirazuddin Haqqani and, and their reference is for the 2008 attacks uh, in Kabul and uh, you know some kind of an assassination uh, attempt against Karzai. It's like where have we lived for the last you know 18 years of, of the, this guy's activity? I mean, it, it's it's hard for me to to come to grips with the evidence is so clear and it's so out there that besides updating our websites. Uh, you know, perhaps we should actually, you know, take take stock of, of what's really happening. And, and of course, we can't forget that Siraj Shaqani uh, took over not just the interior ministry, but but his minions took over the National Director of Intelligence uh, of Security, NDS. And now the General Director of, of Intelligence actually has all the biometrics, all the material that, you know, uh, we had put together uh, as part of an intelligence apparatus that, you know, maybe they burned some of that stuff. Maybe they, they destroyed some of it, but a lot of it is there. So in essence, this is a real problem set that is affecting anybody who's come in contact with us over the last couple of decades uh, in, in Afghanistan. So uh, it, it, once again, I, I know I'm sounding like a broken record sometimes when I talk on the Sufan Center's um, you know, uh, uh, activities, but but for sure, the Taliban in power is a major issue that I think is going under, um, you know, covered. Uh, and I appreciate you, you guys always putting it in the forefront. Um, but again, going back to General Carrillo's comments, um, just to piggyback a little bit on on what Amira mentioned, uh, the the notion of senior military leaders, and I actually. No General Carrillo from, from a previous life. I mean, he's a brilliant man. But but the machine of the US government is sort of geared towards describing an ISK as if they're gonna conduct, you know, external operations and and everybody thinks threat to the homeland. I mean, clearly I I don't see, you know, I, I don't have access to intelligence that may suggest otherwise, but but from what I can see, their external operations are mostly. Um, you know, geared towards regional impact, not necessarily targeting the U.S., perhaps U.S. interests, but not necessarily the homeland. Um, however, one of the things that they've made very clear is that they'll target, you know, Pakistan, as Amira mentioned, um, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, but also uh, Chinese interests. Um, you know, while we were declaring victory over ISK um, in, in 1819, they were declaring, you know, uh, uh, in a way, war against China uh, for the liberation of the Uyghurs, and you know, and that's one of their greatest uh, objectives. And I don't, I don't remember the exact language, but but since 2019, they've been, you know, mentioning quite a bit about that, um, and they've targeted Russian interests in Kabul, 
in, in multiple times the Chinese interest in, 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 in Afghanistan. And so th they're, they're looking to, again, make that play as a regional power, you know, re uh, terror group, as Amira mentioned. But my question is why? Is it for funding? Is it because they are ideologically uh, against certain regional aspects? Um, why, why, are, why are we somehow considering an alignment with the Taliban to counter ISK when the ISK, first of all, horrible group, they do horrible things, but in terms of, you know, if you're picking one versus the other, which I don't believe is the right answer, we shouldn't be picking one or the other. But if you're picking one or the other, I mean, you're actually picking the worst and, and the greater threat. Uh, so I will stop there, but I, I, I do want to highlight that our activities right now as a U.S. government, to me, are perplexing. Uh, I'm not really sure if there is a roadmap that we're trying to follow or if we're, you know, kind of movement to contact, as they say in the military, trying to figure out our way as we're as we're moving ahead. Um, but I will say that we are heading down a very dangerous path, in part because over the last two decades, we should have realized that most of the time we walk into situations with our best intentions. However, we have very little understanding of the environment that we go into, and therefore we tend to get it wrong. So I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Yanni. Some some provocative statements in there, and ones that frankly I, I agree with. I think we we tend to get things wrong more often than we we get things right, um, unfortunately. Uh, and you also referenced, I think you called Afghanistan back to the future. Uh, and we had an intel brief last week that that had that exact title. So my, my question, um, I'll take moderator's preferences for Aryan. We hear we hear a lot of what we shouldn't do, right? We shouldn't engage with the Taliban. Uh, and, and and frankly, I, I agree. If you're if you're advising the National Security Council, what should we do? How do we deal with Afghanistan? Uh, all the other issues besides CT that are important. What what's the strategy there? What would you recommend going forward? Well, uh, first of all, let me mention that I could not agree more uh, with with Yanni's uh, conclusion. So thank you for stating that so uh, clearly. I completely and totally. 100% with you there. Uh, in terms of what would happen if you were to take it very broadly and very briefly, look, the Taliban had an agreement with the United States. It's called the Doha Agreement. In the Doha Agreement, the Taliban had very clear commitments that they made uh, to the United States. They had very clear commitments that they made to the Afghan people. Now, none of those commitments, they've delivered upon none of those commitments. And in fact, that's the only written commitment uh, that the Taliban have put out. So uh, if I were to advise, if I were to suggest things to the NSC, I don't think I can advise them. If I were to make suggestions, it is that hold them accountable to their commitments. Well, the Taliban still, Despite the fact that some people think that, that the U.S. government doesn't have any leverage over the Taliban, I disagree. I think the United States has quite a lot of leverage over the Taliban. The, the, the 40 to $50 million per week that goes, much of that comes from the United States. But also the overall diplomatic weight of the United States goes a very long way. And I'm not saying this out of an assessment, out of uh, analysis. I'm saying this out of the contact that I have daily with people on the ground, even with some, some of the Taliban themselves they are still very much afraid of the United States. They are super afraid of the drones. They see a drone and they run the, 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 the other way. But at the diplomatic level, they would do anything really to, to get the United States to totally engage with them. Because if the United States were to engage with the Taliban, Europe would engage with the Taliban. And if the Taliban would have Europe and the United States, then they could become a viable thing. Now, in using all that leverage, I would suggest that the, that the U.S. would push the Taliban to their agreements and their commitments with the Doha Accords. And there was a number of those that are important. Number one is for them to agree for the establishment of a broad-based government, that it would not be a government only run by the Taliban, that other Afghans, other political striped Afghans, Technocrats would be part of that government, and there would be a broad-based government that would be acceptable to the Afghan people, to the regional countries, and to the world. 
Number one. Number two, their moderation on their the mo moderation on this puritanical policies that they've been forcing upon the people. The issue of women's rights is huge. The issues of minority rights is huge. Uh, so having them to deliver upon those commitments is extremely important. Third, they're cutting off of ties with these foreign terrorist groups. And we talked about that. The three of us talked about that. For how long are they going to house and support terrorist groups who have nothing to do with Afghanistan, but have every intention to hurt uh, the world, be it the region, Europe, or the United States? And then finally, fourth, is this issue of drug trade. And now I saw one, one question uh, directed to me in the, in the comments here, and let me very briefly touch upon that as well. What I'm getting from on the ground right now, in fact, I was speaking to a, a person in uh, Helmand province yesterday over WhatsApp, and he was telling me this. Uh, he's a person who's, who's very informed. Uh, contact is very informed. He was like, uh, since last year, they have banned the cultivation of poppy in most places that are visible. Like along the highways, along the main roads, you don't see poppy fields. But then in certain other areas that are not as visible, you still have some cultivation. Number, number one. Number two, that there is so much reserves of poppy for the past two to three years, given the changes that came in 2021 and even the intensification of the fighting before that, more were produced than what was exported outside. So there's quite a lot of reserve. And now the sort of the ban has resulted really in a skyrocketing of poppy prices and heroin prices. So it's actually to their benefit. Uh, what they have done also is the increase in the production of methamphetamine. And now it's surpassing really the value of opium and, and, and opiates. And it's being produced really largely. The Haqqani network, based on what I'm getting from on the ground, has almost completely moved to meth than, than poppy. ISKP has really, because the question had that, ISKP is getting involved in the meth production and smuggling. And so it's a very profitable, easily produced uh, drug that is uh, that is happening there. Um, sorry that I went every everywhere, but those four would be uh, what I would suggest to the U.S. government. Thank you. No, I mean it's incredibly relevant and and insightful. Um, I, I want I want to switch gears a little bit and ask a question uh, to Amira. You had mentioned um, in in your intervention that you look closely at um, intergroup relationships how alliances shift, but you also mentioned that you look um, closely, well, and I know this because I read most of your work, uh, incentives to conduct external operations. So, you know, Yanni touched on that a little bit about uh, what, we th what we're seeing right now in terms of kind of regional capabilities. Uh, he mentioned General Carrilla as well. Do you see any incentive for ISKP to go beyond the region and target Europe or the West more broadly? Um, and then a kind of caveat or, or second part of that, let's go down that road a little and, and say there was a pretty massive uh, major attack in Europe. What what do you see the reaction uh, from the West, right? Certainly not going to be boots on the ground. Um, it would seem that maybe an over the horizon strike would be insufficient to deal with a threat once it's got to that point. So what might we expect? Uh, that's a great uh, question. Colin, especially around the incentives of ISK to conduct operations externally, right? So I think when people talk about ISK's external operations and we get warnings about their growing capability to be able to attack U.S. interests or uh, U.S. partners of the homeland, we kind of forget about, we just kind of focus on the capability and leave out the incentives piece, right? So I think um, in terms of ISK's um, incentives to launch attacks against Western targets right now, I think would not make sense from a logical perspective. And given that I've sort of stated that we see ISK adapt to its environment and take into account, it's not just its environment, but also its internal organizational characteristics at a given time. So there's no doubt that ISK has lost a series of um, its leaders. And obviously it's used to losing not just its, you know, um, mid-tier, 
uh, leadership, but also its top most emirs. It lost six um, emirs, um, almost one per year, until uh, we saw al Muhajir in place. So currently, given um, the overall environment, right, it is still rebuilding itself to get to that point where it was in its peak years of 2018, when it actually control significant levels of territory. It does not control significant le levels of territory. It has been significantly weakened since its peak years um, before the Taliban's takeover. And now since the Taliban's takeover, uh, the Afghan Taliban are squarely focused on uh, constraining ISK, especially because of these warnings which are coming out of um, Western states, but also the general international community. So when IS, uh, when the Taliban announce and celebrate their um, targeting of ISK leaders, this is also a, a way of signaling, right? Not just to domestic audiences, but to external audiences. Um, so there is pressure, all this to say, there is significant pressure on ISKP right now, especially given the international pressure on the Taliban. So in this context, for ISK to go and attempt um, an attack in Europe or in the U.S. It just does not make sense because it will bring in additional um, counterterrorism pressure, not perhaps just from uh, the U.S., but also from regional countries who are pretty concerned, such as China um, and Russia. And so in terms of your second, you know, the second part, um, what can we expect the reaction to be? Um, I think... Um, in the past, the reaction, the tendency has been to lash out with hundreds of strikes against the group, right? Um, go after its um, leadership or go after its known hideouts. Um, over the horizon, strikes are likely to happen because that's what we've seen in the past, even when we had troops on the ground, right? Um, I think regionally, the reaction will be interesting um, because for example, how China will react um, remains to be seen, but China has expressed its displeasure um, with the levels of terrorism within Pakistan, but also Afghanistan, because it seriously disrupts its own plans. Um, and the same goes for Russia. So I think the Taliban don't just risk international intervention in the form of strikes, but it could also seriously harm their relationships with their neighboring countries, especially the ones they're looking to for significant levels of investment, such as China has indicated its intentions to um, invest in its mining industry, which can be significant for the Taliban. Um, so my initial, I think, um, assessment is that strikes are the tool that we have used in the past, and it's probably the tool that we're going to use in, in the future. Thank you very much. And, and actually, your, your comments on China um, are a perfect segue to my next question. Well, it's actually a question from uh, that, that we received prior to the webinar, and this is from um, M. Bottenheim, a trustee. Uh, at the, the Ari Neve Trust, which has been a generous sponsor of the Sufan Center's work in the past. So thank you for submitting that. Uh, and, and the question, and I'll pose this to Yanni, is, um, is Afghanistan's application for participation in the Belt and Road Initiative a first step that might force China to be drawn in militarily because further destabilizing uh, of the region might affect their minorities? So what what's your take on how does China play this? I know we tend to be at least I tend to be Western focused. How does this impact the U.S., Europe? But China is a you know a big player, obviously, uh, in the region and and in Afghanistan. So what? How do you see that playing out moving forward? Uh, it's a great question, and and actually, it's a you know part of the paradoxical approach that we as a U.S. government takes to uh, uh, to 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 you know our great power competition context. Uh, uh, because if we say, hey, it's time to pivot from the forever wars and, you know, really get to the great power competition, you can read China, Russia, uh, and, and to a lesser extent, some of the other uh, minor uh, powers. But, but for the most part, everybody thinks China instantaneously. Well, our removal of, uh, of our footprint um, a removal of our infrastructure, a removal of the longest runway in Central Asia uh, from the equation, and and the uh, you know abandonment of of an ally uh, at at a 
and by the way, when I say an ally, I'm not talking about the Afghan government. I'm talking about the Afghan people, uh, those that have bled and 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 almost aligned their interests with us. When we abandon this, and we abandon our 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 basing, um, in the context of great power competition, you know, there there is a loss. And and one of the things that I I find fascinating is. Um, when, when uh, let's say countries don't even look just in Afghanistan, when you look at countries in Africa that China may want to enter, and we say, don't get in bed with the Chinese, don't, 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 don't let them come in here, don't let them give you loans, don't let them get involved in your infrastructure. Well, competition requires, wait for it, competition. You know, so, so when, when you're actually making an argument that's not competitive, it's kind of hard to actually compete. So in Afghanistan, we removed what we had in terms of competition advantages over China, whether it's the minerals, whether it's the, you know, in, the, in terms of extractives or whether it's influence in the region. Um, I don't think to answer the question specifically, I don't think that China is going to get involved mil militarily. Their approach is mostly economic. And Belt and Road is an economic interest rather than a, a security I issue. Um, they have a much longer term approach. I mean, you can look at INAC as one of the mining projects that you know didn't really become anything because um, they're not looking at it. I need to uh, you know bring it on board or online at a particular time frame. They're looking at where does it fit in my overall. Uh, you know, extraction mechanisms uh, rather than, you know, just an immediacy. So um, I think they may have some issues with uh, some of the uh, Muslim minorities uh, and, and how they deal with that, but that's more of an internal problem. It's not necessarily an external issue. And, uh, and if anything, they're going to try to make a deal because for anybody on this program, you know, we have to worry about Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. We have to worry about certain behaviors that are um, requiring us with our passports to do certain things. Well, when you're China Inc. and you're going into these places with the clear understanding, hey, we'll do whatever it takes, we'll pay whatever bribe, we'll deal with whatever mechanism to get things accomplished, they're not as concerned about that. So. Uh, you know, whether they were going to pay off the Taliban or whether they're going to pay off some other group, I, I don't think they have as much of a qualm as as we perhaps have. So I, I, I probably should pause there. But uh, if I didn't if I didn't cover something that was of interest, please let me know. No, I think it's a great point. Um, and, and I tend to agree with you that China is, uh, you know, not likely to get involved militarily. Although, as I've written with uh, my colleague Molly Saltzkog in the in the past, uh, if we are to see you know, if China goes full in on BRI in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and you continue to see an uptick in attacks against Chinese infrastructure, they may be forced to devote uh, some kind of, you know, personnel, whether that's private security contractors, to to guard their their investments, right, and their kind of pipelines and resources there. Uh, we certainly see in Pakistan. Uh, an uptick, uh, not only, you know, but by groups like uh, BLA and others, right? There's been a number of kind of attacks against China. So, um, yeah. And and again, that's to, to be written. I want to uh, turn it over to our executive director, uh, Noreen Fink, uh, real quick uh, for a question that she'd like to post. All right. Thank, thanks, Colin. Just a really quick question. And Ariane, you, you alluded to some of this in your comment. In all the security dynamics and tribal and factional and structural fragmentation we're all talking about, it does feel a lot like the human rights infractions and violations are, you know, are going to get caught in the crossfire. No one seems like the best answer for repaired human rights, you know, social contract in the country. So my question had a bit to do with leverage and, you know, what the way forward is. What kind of leverage would there be to address some of the human rights violations or some of the, you know, Ariane, you talked about making them st stick to their commitments, but what leverage do you think would work? And do you think what we're seeing in terms of um, the rate of violations and sort of the repression of women's rights, is that just a, a ploy? Is that sort of a maximalist approach to try and extract some kind of concession or leverage uh, from the West, whether it's the UN or the US or something? So how do we make things better using that leverage you were talking about? 
Yeah, well, that's that really is an important question, Nuri, and thank you for asking that. Um, <clears throat> the way I see things is that uh, for as long as it's a Taliban run, fully Taliban run Afghanistan, we cannot really improve any any of that aspects of things. Uh, so the only way to really get uh, any improvement on the issue of human rights, uh, the woman rights, uh, rights of minorities, um, you know, and civil liberties in general, uh, is to really uh, bring the Taliban back to the negotiation table and get them to accept a more broad-based government there. Something that would actually res be a government, what is going on right now doesn't even resemble a government. It's still the Taliban uh, as, uh, as an insurgent group, the Taliban as a terrorist group, having taken over government apparatus. They have not even... Uh, uh, assimilated into government structure. So, so to me, it is really just one way to get them to accept a more broad-based government. Now, what leverage that the world, especially the West, would have on that? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, well, the first thing to do is it's really important to unify the position of the West. And when I'm talking about the West, we, of course, talk about, you know, U.S., Canada, Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, the Western, Western countries in general, to come up with a unified approach uh, with regard to uh, that, uh, that issue, with regard to Afghanistan and, and the region. And then there is quite a lot of leverage. Diplomatic leverage is there. As I mentioned earlier, the Taliban are seeking recognition, not formal recognition. They don't even... They cannot even imagine having formal recognition the way they are, but some sort of recognition by by the world, and of course the West is the main the, the main uh, uh, entity for that as as in general. So diplomatic uh, pressure, diplomatic leverage is there. Financial leverage is there as well. Uh, even though the Taliban are making a lot of money, I mean the state apparatus, uh, based on what I got from the Ministry of Finances. Last year, in the year 2022, they raised over $2.24 billion in government revenues. And that's quite a lot of revenue uh, to raise. And on the other side, they are engaged in all sorts of illicit economic activity. The drug trade we talked about, but they also have, uh, you know, the extraction and smuggling of the mineral uh, deposits. They have, uh, you know, the cutting down and smuggling of trees and logs. There is a, a human smuggling. There is animal, you know, all sorts of illicit economic activities. Extortion is still going on. So they do uh, collect quite a lot of revenues. Nevertheless, uh, the funds that are going in cash, uh, 40 to $50 million per week is substantial. In fact, by most assessments, this is the only thing that is going on that has kept the value of Afghani, the currency, stable, which is an extremely important thing for the survival of the Taliban. So financial uh, leverage is number, number two. Uh, third is some kind of military pressure. And of course, I, I'm not talking about uh, boots on the ground at all. Uh, given the circumstances in the world, you cannot even, even imagine that. But to be able to also continue, and, and Amira uh, uh, did uh, allude to this, uh, the over-the-horizon CT operations and over-the-horizon CT operation, not only against ISKP, but also against the Taliban themselves. I mean, he only talked about uh, 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 Sirajuddin Haqqani, for instance, being still uh, on, um, uh, um, on on the website of uh, 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 of the national director of Secu uh, national uh, uh, director of intelligence here. Uh, you know, a number of these Taliban are still on sanctions list, be it the multilateral UN sanctions list or bilateral sanctions list. Enforcement of those sanctions and uh, you know using some military pressure through this over the horizon city operations, I think uh, is quite uh, a big leverage and combining these three can really go a long way. Thanks very much, Arian. Uh, thank you. I um, I want to pivot back very briefly to, um, to Yanni to talk about, uh, we had mentioned the, uh, how would you advise the National Security Council? Um, and I wanted you to kind of get your uh, opportunity to chime in on that. Uh, thanks. I, I mean, obviously, this can go uh, a few more hours uh, of a conversation, which I, I, I sincerely think that uh, 
places like the Soufan Center, um, you know, covering this, we should do more of. Because unfortunately, what I fear the most is that um, if if history is a teaches us some lessons, the National Security Council uh, tends to listen to some wrong people. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying it to 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 uh, to you know throw mud at it. It's just that they're very busy, and obviously Afghanistan is one issue and the myriad of uh, issues to consider. But who are they really listening to in terms of what to do next in Afghanistan? I hope they're listening to Ariane and Amira, but you know that's not necessarily the the case. I, I would not necessarily be um, as uh, enthusiastic about the diplomatic. And uh, and even the kinetic strike uh, approaches that that Arian uh, mentioned. Um, not that I don't believe in what he's saying as as accurate. I just don't think that we are willing to go as far as we need to go in order to achieve certain things. And, I, and I'll give specific examples. Um, we have entire generations of people that we trusted, talked to, that are now refugees. Uh, one of my closest friends that I had in Kabul for you know the last 15 years is is a refugee, and he was a you know one of the smartest, most dedicated persons to the Afghan mission that I know, and and you know breaks my heart every time I talk to him because you know he he and his family and his father who's been fighting you know uh, uh, Afghan issues that have been aligned with our our interest are you know refugees i mean and and there's no room in the end for them even in the us uh, model and so um you know it, it's real hard to think that some conversation uh by tom west or anybody else that's in the state department in some room in doha is going to really have any impact uh, i just can't see it uh until we're ready to cut off the money uh, un until we're ready to actually say that, hey, we have screwed up Afghanistan, fair enough, but you know, it's gonna be a lot more painful uh, for the Taliban. Uh, and, and by extension, unfortunately, the Afghan people, if we're gonna change something and concentrate also on bringing in the right leaders, uh, Afghan leaders, that will be the people that will actually go back and do certain things, or maybe they're still there. Uh, but the idea of just applying pressure right now, I, I don't think that the increment of pressure is going to make a bit of difference to the Taliban. I mean, I'll give you the other example that I was planning on, on, on mentioning, um, you know, the, the drug efforts. We, we let go Bashir Nurzai. I mean, uh, how, how do you equate letting go one of the biggest drug lords, you know, that we have and 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 allowing the 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 drug trafficking that's that's really going to hurt Europe. That's going to hurt a lot of regional players. Not to forget that Afghanistan has its own drug issues internally. Uh, uh, but you know, but in Afghanistan, I guess it's okay for the Taliban to tie somebody to a radiator and say, okay, you're gonna you know wean yourself off of drugs that way. Whereas you know that doesn't work in the West as much. So uh, I. I think the NSC has to have some serious thoughts that go beyond how did we screw up the withdrawal? I think we, we need to think about how did we screw up Afghanistan altogether? Um, I think our trust from regional allies on how we betrayed certain things is, is a real um, you know, issue, reputational risk issue that's playing out in the Middle East right now. Um, and so these are much bigger issues and about how do we, you know, band-aid uh, situation in Afghanistan with just some minor diplomatic or or even kinetic strikes? Yeah, I mean, I tend to share your pessimism, frankly, and I think you know, letting go one of the biggest drug lords in the world uh, feeds into some of the conspiracy theories that when I was in Kabul, I would hear from Afghans that said, you know, if the United States wanted to stop this drug trafficking, they easily could. And you know, some of these uh, conspiracies were pretty wild. They point to planes in the sky and say, look that those uh, planes are bringing drugs from Afghanistan to the United States. That's why everybody's hooked on heroin and, you know, it, it's being allowed. So, uh, which only further delegit delegitimized our presence there. Uh, we, we are getting pretty close to the end here, but I, I want to ask uh, another question from the audience. Um, and I appreciate the panelists that have kind of been uh, keeping an eye on the, the Q&A and 
uh, incorporating their answers, uh, which have actually uh, answered several questions that have popped up in, in the chart. So very diligent panelists, thank you. Um, you're setting a high standard. Uh, well, there's a question about non-Taliban, non-ISK uh, groups. So what is the role of the Northern Alliance or any other kind of anti-Taliban resistance groups in the country? Um, it's not for anyone specific. So if there's uh, a panelist that that wants to take that, uh, are these, you know, groups, do they have any promise? Uh, is there, you know, something tangible that they could achieve against uh, the Taliban? Or is it just too little, too late? Uh, are they too insignificant in size and capacity? I, I can uh, uh, go ahead, Aaron, because I saw. You, you go um, ahead. Go ahead, please. Just just briefly, because, you know, um, irregular warfare, I mean, the panelists focus on a lot of important things. My my latest, you know, kind of pondering besides Afghanistan is irregular warfare. And I think if we if we say, hey, we're ready to leave Afghanistan in about 2020, 2021, you know, if you think about the Doha agreement and or what happened with the Biden administration, I think one of the issues in irregular warfare should have been you know, what's the unconventional part of this that we need to put in place? What if the Taliban take over? I mean, we're making deals with them. What, how do we, you know, remain influential? And I think had we seeded some of those groups, perhaps, and prepared them in early 2020, 2021, maybe we would have had something ready to, to, to offer a reasonable counter to the Taliban. But if we are going to do it now and we have to commit, it's a it's a multi-year project. It isn't just add water and stir. And it has to be covert. It has to be, you know, more clandestine at best. Uh, it, it has to be quiet. It, it's not going to be done. You know, uh, uh, so I I think that uh, um, it, it, it's a much uh, uh, more robust activity, but a quiet activity. And it's going to take time. I'd say, you know, to show my pessimism and prove it, we had 20 years to do this overtly with the Afghan National Security Forces and, and couldn't really meet the mail there. So a couple of years of doing it covertly to me, probably, you know, a drop in the bucket versus what needs to be done. Um, but again, that's just kind of, I think, as a native New Yorker, pessimism is built into my DNA. Um, but Arian, I didn't know if you had any um, comments on that. Uh, very, very quickly, and sort of an extension of what Yanni uh, said, uh, is that currently there are 14, 13, 14 groups that have declared their existence, armed groups against the Taliban. Of, of the 14, uh, and I have the full list I could share uh, with, 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 uh, with you if you would be interested, um, only two are a little bit more visible. The NRA, the National Resistance Front, and of course the National Freedom Front. Those are the two uh, that are more visible uh, on the ground. However, even their activities, um, you know, it's very, very minimal. It's very partial. And the fact is that that, that support structure that, that Yanni alluded to indirectly for uh, for creating an irregular warfare force and sustaining it, it doesn't exist really there. And even if the United States wanted to do that, if, even solely U.S. support would not be enough for that because geographical support is extremely important for that. And so uh, countries in the region, at least certain countries in the region, would need to be uh, in line with that policy to support that. Uh, until such time, uh, to my assessment, that is that you know this kind of resistance will really not uh, amount to to anything tangible. Thank you very much. Uh, we are pushing up against time, so I'm going to turn it back over to Noreen to close us out. That that's really unfair because you're just scapegoating me for not being able to address all the questions in in the webinar. Um, look, we have a ton of questions, and I know, uh, you know, I'm with Gianni. We could have gone on for hours on this. Um, so hopefully we will get a chance to follow up and have all of you uh, back for these discussions. There's a lot of questions and no answers, and I think that is the challenge of Afghanistan, right? Right now, um, the situations we're looking at have no easy or quick solutions. And as Colin pointed out, 20 years um, you know, of lessons learned didn't seem to help. However, we do have to keep trying. Um, you know, I, I take the point that things are complicated, but I, I don't think that absolves us of the effort to try. 
Um, you know, the point we heard uh, in Doha, we heard this at our previous webinar, you know, there are people struggling right now with the effects of the Taliban and what's happening. And so I think letting the conversation fade is not an option. We have to keep trying to do what we can. And so I hope there will be opportunities to, to follow up on the questions raised. I hope the right people are listening. And if not, we'll get louder. You know, we'll try. Um, and to that end, I, I look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you. But but a huge thank you to to Gianni, to Ariane, to Amira, and, and certainly to Colin for keeping the conversation going. And to our TSC team, Sean, Mo, Stephanie, you know, thank you for making this happen. And I hope all of you watching stay in touch and then come back at us with the questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.